This talk is given by Stephanie Weiner. Steph uh, was working in the hacking community on various things for a while, and then she decided to do more theoretical research. Um, she got her PhD in Amsterdam and is now a postdoc at Caltech in sunny California. And she's going to tell us uh, how to use quantum mechanics and noise to do cryptography. OK, well, thanks, Chris, for the introduction. Um, yeah, in my former life, I did more practical things. For example, I worked for Job at IT6. Um, and I'm going to talk about quantum cryptography and, in fact, what goes beyond using it for key distribution, as Vadim was talking about yesterday. And, in fact, I will talk about how to make the most of noise, something which normally is actually bad for us. So I have worked with a lot of different people on this, uh, on this uh, subject. Christian is here. You just saw him. So you can talk to him later. Um, and before I actually talk about any quantum things, let me explain to you what the problem is that we are trying to solve. So we want to implement two-party protocols between two parties, Alice and Bob. And all the problems that I will be considering are of the following form. So Alice and Bob have agreed on some function. So this function is known to both of them. Alice herself has some input x, which is unknown to Bob. And Bob has some input y, which is unknown to Alice. And at the end of the day, they want to compute the function of f of x and y. Um, is the mic not working? I cannot really tell from here. Mic is working? OK, great. OK. So that's what I want to do. However, there is a little bit of a problem. Namely, Alice does not actually trust Bob. So she wants to make sure that whatever he can do, he can only learn the output of this function, but nothing more about her original input x. And at the same time, Bob is quite suspicious of Alice, and he wants to be sure that Alice cannot learn his input y. Okay. So you might say, why is this uh, interesting? So I want to give you some examples of problems which are of this form. So maybe I should also say, I mean, of course, in, in reality, they don't have such a beautiful box, but they have to solve this problem by talking over a channel, say a classical or, in fact, a quantum channel. So going to the example, maybe Bob, after he's had enough of camping, wants to sell his tent. He places an ad for a slightly used tent, and Alice is potentially interested in buying this tent. And she has in her mind, looking at this picture, maybe it should be worth 40 euros. Bob has in his mind, ah, this is much worse, worth much more, maybe it's 120 euros. And for example, one possible function they could wish to evaluate is the following. So if Alice is willing to pay less than some minimum asking price that Bob puts in, so he wants to have at least 120 euros, then we'll output no and we'll reject the transaction. And otherwise, we'll output, in fact, the price that Alice has suggested. And Bob is going to be happy with everything above his minimum asking price. So this problem is of this form. Um, other problems, which are also, I mean, potentially quite interesting, and in fact, Job has been going on about it in his talk. Namely, Alice wants to identify herself to Bob, possibly some ATM machine or a building, and she holds a password or some kind of pin code. And so she walks up to the machine and says, hey, I'm Alice. I claim I have a certain password. And ideally, you would like to have something that works as this following box here. So Alice would input her password. Bob, if he would be really an ATM machine, can look up what password Alice should have. And he inputs this in this box. And out comes yes and no. Yes, if the both are the same, and no otherwise. And so clearly there's some obvious security constraints. Maybe Bob is not really an ATM machine, but something someone else has placed there. So you want to be sure that Bob cannot learn the password if he doesn't know it already, more than by just guessing one and checking whether it worked. And similarly for Alice, if Alice is not actually Alice, she does not really know the password, 
all she should be able to do is to guess a password and find out whether it worked. So these are the kind of problems we're interested in solving. And let's maybe see how this should be possible. Unfortunately, it's impossible to do this if Alice and Bob, where all they have is some classical or even quantum communication line and thus no other resources. But it does become possible under some classical assumptions. For example, that factoring is difficult. So factoring, I guess all of you know, I have a number, usually larger than 15, and I want to know what are its prime factors. So as Vadim mentioned yesterday, this can be done efficiently on a quantum computer. And, and in fact, it's not even known classically whether this assumption is really correct. And actually, as you just saw from Job, there is many other attacks on a smart card that go far beyond this, which are more practical. So some other assumption one can make is that classical storage is bounded. So I cannot store too many bits. Now you might say, this is possibly quite unrealistic. I have a hard drive which has, I don't know, many gigabytes. Um, so this is not a very believable assumption. So a natural assumption is to assume that, in fact, we don't consider classical storage, but we consider quantum storage. So I want to store quantum bits. And that I should not be able to store too many. Or in fact, more generally, that my storage is imperfect. And what I will call noisy. And I will tell you in a second what exactly I mean by that. So maybe to tell you why this assumption is a bit more realistic than classical storage, uh, what is the state of the art of quantum memories today? So there's two places where actually noise can occur. Normally, in our setting, quantum bits will be encoded in some photon. And you want to store this over a long period of time. Generally, you can convert it to something else, for example, some atomic ensemble. And already in this conversion, something can go wrong. In addition, even if you have managed to actually convert it and store it, there can be errors in storage. And in, in, actually, the best memories that are available today can store a small handful of qubits and assuming that I've made this conversion, they can stay in this storage for about a millisecond. So quantum storage is not very advanced yet, and we will actually make use of that. Okay. So I want to talk a bit about noisy storage. So what does it mean to have noisy storage? Then, of course, uh, I guess what you've all been waiting for, namely, we will talk about quantum things, in particular, uncertainty relations. Then I will introduce a small simp uh, a cryptographic building block that we'll consider, and I'll sketch you a protocol for it and try to give you some intuition about why this can work. OK. So what is noisy storage? In order to talk about this, I want to talk about sending information over a channel. So some things you're all familiar with. For example? Say I have the identity channel. And what it does is I input one bit, and exactly the same bit comes out. So this is great. It works perfectly. But channels may, in general, um, not be quite as nice as this one. For example, a very simple classical channel is where I input a bit. And in here, you can imagine that we flip a coin with some probability, maybe a half. And if we succeed, then indeed we output the original bit, so here zero. But there is some chance that we'll actually output the wrong bit. So this is an example of a noisy channel. And you may be wondering, because I'm talking about storage, how does do these channels actually relate to noise in storage? Is that you can think about all noise that happens in memory as a noisy channel. So again, where can the noise happen? There's basically two main sources. First, 